Do you have a property that you use for hunting? Or maybe you just like to see wildlife on your property. Do you want to encourage more to move in? Have you ever sat down and made a plan for how to get more wildlife and better habitat on your property? Did you know that there are folks out there that will come help you make a plan to make your habitat better? Most of these plans won't be rocket science, but there is a science to it. This requires an expert. Zach Lukovich from Whetstone Habitat is a certified wildlife biologist. He's a level two deer steward with National Deer Association. He knows more plants by name than I have room to store in my brain. Zach is well versed on what you can improve on your property for the wildlife and then also to have more of the native flora and fauna. In this episode, Zach's going to tell us how he deals with invasive species of plants and trees. More importantly, he's going to tell us what we should do before we get started or even think about cutting down a tree. He addresses some easy things that you can do in just a few hours. We'll talk about how to clean up what's already there and how to utilize what you have. That's different for each property. Then Zach dives into the improvements that you can make that Mother Nature does not provide. He's also going to touch on what to do with small properties. It's not just for the big ones. Zach invited us down to his family farm in Kentucky to show us firsthand how he's implementing his plan and what he's done to get rid of invasives. And it's an ongoing thing that he's working on. We spent an entire day learning from a master. Anybody that hunts property that is their own or that they lease is going to get something out of the show. Our team dug through all of Zach's notes and found every piece of gear that he talked about utilizing in this process. We've linked to them down in the show notes. In some cases, if you buy from these links, we're going to get a kickback at Go Wild. When we get that commission, we're going to turn around and give a percentage of that back to Raise Them Outdoors, which is an organization that helps teach kids how to hunt, fish, and camp, and frankly, just to love the outdoors. All right, here we go. Welcome to Gearbox Talk with Zach Vukovic. So talk us through a little bit of a day-to-day -day of a habitat consultant. What are you doing for your clients when you go into a property? What are you looking for? That kind of thing. So the main thing I want to do is I'll talk with the landowner before I ever even show up on site. We'll try to figure out what his objectives are. Does he want more quail on his property? Is he a big time deer hunter? A lot of these guys, they want a place where they can consistently get their grandkids on nice deer. So they want me to deal with, with the whitetail habitat or the big time turkey hunter. So what are your objectives? Are you going to be ripping four wheelers around all the time? Are you going to be going for hikes on your property? It's like every property is different. Every landowner has different objectives and goals for their place. Is it, do they want a marketable timber value down the road? What have you? So I want to meet with them ahead of time and kind of discuss what direction he wants to go with that property. So when the day comes, I show up at his property on site. It's then we're kind of doing an inventory. We're, we're trying to keep track of what do you have? Um, what are you lacking? Is it, is it bedding cover? Is it fawning cover? Um, are you lacking nutrition during the summertime? It might be adding food plots in the summertime. Um, are your crop trees, are, are, do you have an overstocked forest? So your crop trees, that you might have a bunch of oak trees, but they're not producing a good crop because there's too many trees competing with each other. So I'll walk every square inch of that property owner. I've been on properties for three days straight where we're just covering every section of, of that property, trying to figure out what the best game plan is when, when you look at his objectives. So what's your access gonna be? How are you gonna do it? What sort of time are you willing to invest in the property to get it to where you want? Um, are you willing to bring in third parties like, like the NRCS or the federal government where they can actually help assist some of these habitat management programs um, so we'll kind of get together, tour the property, and I'll start to tease apart what's going on. Was it, was it high graded way back when, which means somebody came in and cut down all the valuable timber. The valuable timber is typically your crop producing trees. So what's left over? All the soft mass, your beech and your maples, and some of these less desirables for wildlife will be left dominating your forest. So it's really being able to look at a woodlot or walk through a field and see if it's choked full of invasive, see if you have high value uh, forage and, and vegetation and, and trees there and figuring out what's going to be the most time efficient, cost efficient means to improve on that, on what you already have with that property. So let's, let's say you've looked at the property, you've taken the, the inventory that you're talking about. What's the first kind of steps that you're going to do to the vegetation that's already there on the ground? So an area like this, it was closed canopy woodlot. 
Um, there wasn't a ton of understory. It was very heavily used. It was actually an old home site. There's a, there's a foundation of a stone house over there. We can show you later. But it was it was just choked out. It wasn't getting any sunlight. Um, it was pretty much bare ground everywhere you looked. So I'll see an area like that where there's nothing provided for the deer. I mean, a deer can't eat the leaves off a tree when they're 40 foot up in the air. So we need to figure out how to get that vegetation to ground level to a deer's level for them to be able to access, consume, hide behind, bed next to this vegetation. So we should know, like, we're focusing on primarily deer hunting as the focus of this property. Correct. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times when you're, when you're managing for deer, it's going to benefit all wildlife. They're such an edge species and they like diversity so much. I'm very big into our native. I put a very high priority on our native uh, vegetation species. Um, I, I put a very big bounty on <laughs> the non-native species because it's taking up space for what should be something native that can be utilized by our pollinators, our deer, our songbirds. So when you're managing for deer, you end up in turn providing better quality habitat more diverse habitat for all the other species around um but for an area like this yeah it, it's getting to know it's chock full of uh, maple uh, there's a lot of red maple a lot of tulip poplar some black walnut mixed in here and there was a couple little red oaks and a chinkapin oak that i i kept around because i i want them i want to give them an opportunity i take out the competition the trees competing with it and I give those oaks a species to grow faster, grow straighter, produce more crop down the road. But what it also does is it opens up, you can see behind us all of this. It used to be just bare dirt and we got wing stem, we got hairy mountain mint. There's some stilt grass in here, which, which I'm addressing as we go. Um, there's pawpaw, there's some of the tulip poplar starting to sprout up. Um, I saw some wild senna over there. Um, there's all these great high value nutrition food sources that were already here in the seed bank. They just weren't given the opportunity to grow because it was always shaded out. So we're just letting mother nature do its thing. We're replicating a disturbance. This would have been, who knows, a, a lightning strike or a tornado touchdown where it gets rid of a bunch of the tree canopy and then the seeds have a chance to germinate. So we're just trying to replicate those natural processes on a small scale across your property. So clearing out those trees, obviously your best friend's a chainsaw, but what's, what's your process for taking out a tree? So the first thing I wanna do is you need to identify the tree. If you don't know what it is, don't cut it down. You also wanna ensure if, if, it's, if it's worth keeping around. Does it have a high wildlife value uh, associated with that tree species? So we talked earlier about like white oaks or uh, red oaks, uh, chink pin. Um, if there's a good looking walnut tree, yeah, the deer's not gonna eat the walnuts, but that's gonna be a high value timber sale down the road. So I'll leave those big straight walnuts for you. So identify what the tree is, figure out how you can best get that tree on the ground. And depending on which species it is, will dictate what I do to that tree. So something like a tulip poplar. Um, if I'm gonna cut a tulip poplar down, yes, it will shoot up stump sprouts and suckers around, around the base of that stump, but I haven't noticed deer have a very strong attraction to that food source versus something like a black walnut if you cut a black walnut down at ankle level and it starts shooting up those stump sprouts, it looks like a porcupine where all these stems are coming out and they're nipping the ends off of it on an ongoing basis and kind of keeping it trimmed down where it looks like a bush of a bunch of stems because they like those black walnut stump sprouts so much. So if I cut down that tulip poplar that they're not going to touch the stump sprouts, its root system still intact. It's still throwing up stump sprouts. It will grow back if you don't do something to treat it. So that's when I'll come through with herbicide and I like using, again, Roundup at a higher concentration, about 20% Roundup. I like putting a blue dye in the mixture when I apply it so I know which stumps I treated, which ones I haven't. And as soon as I cut that thing, I'll treat the stump with the herbicide and it'll soak into the root system and it'll kill that stump. When I cut down the black walnut, I want those stump sprouts. Those deer are gonna keep that thing eaten down so much, I don't have to worry about that tree growing up and it then later on shading out the canopy. And if it does get that big, just go back with your chainsaw or set of loppers and set it back. Um, so it keeps trying to throw out those stump sprouts. So you're identifying what it is and then you want your tree to fall in a, in a safe direction. Once you decide how you're gonna cut it down, you wanna make sure there's no vines or anything that it's gonna get snagged on. You wanna make sure there's a safe direction to get that tree falling. And then um, you're, you're just getting it on the ground. If, if you got a big trunk laying in the area, you don't want it, cut the trunk up. 
move it off to the side and just and just leave the ground exposed like oftentimes i'm doing it along on roads so i have easy access where i can i can haul everything with my tie by side out here um, so getting the tree down safely treating it when applicable not treating it when not applicable and then just sort of cleaning up after yourself like i leave some tree tops and stuff laying around it's good cover it, it's automatically covered directly on the ground you can leave that there another trick you can do if you do want to replant with different trees or shrubs plant those trees directly into the treetops that you just put on the ground. That way you don't need tree tubes like this because the actual canopy of that tree when it's laying on the ground will prevent deer from being able to get in there and, and nip the ends of those, those newly planted bushes out. So there's a bunch of tricks you can do along the way, but yeah, ideally you want sunlight on the ground. If you're doing something like this for a natural wildlife opening or like NRCS might call it a temporary forest opening, 80% sunlight is typically the goal. You, you want this nice flush of vegetation to crop up. So let's hear a lot of talk about hinge cutting. So let's talk a little bit about that. What's your approach to hinge cutting? Are you looking for certain types of trees, certain size, anything like that? So I like doing the soft wood. Um, you'll look at something like a maple. Um, Iron wood's a little harder. It does hinge cut fairly nicely though. Um, it works well. The thing you got to remember when you're hinge cutting, especially if it's in an area that you're eventually going to sell as part of a timber sale, those hinge cut trees don't die. It's kind of the point. You leave part of that bark and trunk layer intact so that tree remains viable for years to come, continues throwing off leaves, um, which is great for wildlife. But if you're going to go through and you're going to sell that section of timber for a logging crew to come in, all of a sudden there's a bunch of trip hazards everywhere that never decayed. Um, so that's something you got to keep in mind with hinge cutting. Another thing is people will hinge cut too much. So they'll, they'll do it all over the area and all of a sudden it's in, you can't get through it. A deer can't get through it. Um, so hinge cutting, I'm looking for, for the softer species. And I'm typically, if I'm, even if I'm doing a bedding thicket and I'm going through and I'm cutting uh, one of those temporary wildlife openings, something maybe a quarter acre to three quarters of an acre in size, I'm probably only going to hinge cut 25 to 35 percent of the trees the rest of them is what i'd call a flush cut where you're cutting it all the way through the stump to promote those stump sprouts but i like going in typically around chest height so it's comfortable with the chainsaw if you go much higher than that the saws over your head it can get dangerous also it's tough to get leverage on that tree once you cut through it to pull it down so about chest height maybe belly height cut I'd like to do it in sections, so I'll try halfway through the tree and push it. If it's a bigger tree, you might have to go two-thirds of the way through it. And then pull that tree down um, in the direction you want it. One of the things I like doing um, when I'm going to go ahead and hinge cut is in an area like this where I have a stand set up back there, but deer like pouring in off this hillside, I'll start hinge cutting like that one's hinge cut right there because I want to, and there's another one behind it, hinge cut in the same direction. So I'm building uh, a barrier for those deer that they have to get around. Sure, it, a deer could jump over that, but they're not going to. They're pretty lazy. They'll, they'll typically always walk around it. So you're building kind of a natural funnel to, to force these deer into an area where they won't be downwind to me. They'll come out because I don't want them to get down to that road where I might access the stand from. So I'm trying to force them into this opening this way. So you can use hinge cuts to your advantage in, in that situation as well. So we talked a little bit earlier about your approach to a bedding area. Beyond the hinge cut, you said you want to make sure you've got an entrance and an exit. Can you talk a little bit about that approach? Yeah, so when you're going through and you're making these temporary forest openings or bedding thickets, um, a lot of times you get in there and you start cutting stuff down and the area you're working is, is nice and clear because you don't want to be stepping over all these limbs and stuff. And I've done it a couple of times where I'll catch myself and I'll hinge these trees or lay all these trees over and it's shaped like a big donut with like one entrance in and out where I was coming in and out of that section. A deer's going to bed in there, sure, no problem. But something people need to realize is the predators are smart. Think of a coyote or a black bear if they're used to deer bedding in a certain area, especially because you designed it for the deer to bed there. Um, if there's only one way in and out, those predators have a huge advantage of them. So one thing I always try to keep in mind when doing those bedding thickets is have multiple entrances and exits for that bedding thicket. But again, if you're trying to steer deer in one direction or the other coming out of that thicket, maybe 20 yards off of there, you can hinge out a row of trees and sort of force them around that way as opposed to forcing them out of one spot on that bedding thicket. So you've got some trees behind you here too that you talked about girding the tree. What's, what's the reason for that? So when you girdle the tree, it's just kind of a, uh, 
you're taking the cambium layer, which is the layer right inside of the bark on the trunk, outside of the trunk, that brings all the nutrients up to the leaves and then back down to the root system in the fall. So when you girdle a tree, you're actually cutting all the way around the tree in a, in a ring. And I usually do two of them just to be safe. Um, all the way around cutting through that cambium layer. And then they'll come through with like triclopyr, really high concentration of glyphosate. Um, and I'll, I'll treat that section of the tree. So what you're doing then is you're killing the tree, but you're leaving it standing. So I'm trying to get sunlight to the ground. Some of these tulip poplars were, were huge. And I was out here by myself. I didn't feel comfortable cutting them down when, when I'm out here alone. I don't have great cell phone service. Heaven forbid something happens. So I wanted to make sure I could kill those trees to get sunlight on the ground, but I didn't want to knock them over just because it wouldn't have been safe. So I girdled them. It does a couple things. It creates a really good habitat for, for woodpeckers. It'll start losing its bark. Um, the woodpeckers will move in and they'll start making cavities in the holes, getting at some of those grubs and stuff growing inside of that, that now dead standing tree. Once the woodpeckers move out, you get your screech owls and you get your, your um, flying squirrels and your gray squirrels. You get all of this wildlife utilizing that dead snag now. Um, so it's just an added habitat type. It might not be for deer, but it's, it benefits the deer in that it lets more sunlight hit the ground. Um, so girdling the trees is an option. One thing you got to remember when you're doing that is you don't want to have your stand next to a tree that's been girdled for a couple years. Because as we saw earlier, they do fall over eventually. And if you're sitting in a tree stand or a ground blind, run it right underneath one, like <laughs> you're done for. So it's just something to keep in mind. If it's out of the way of anything that you're that you're doing on a regular basis, it, it's a good option for killing those trees. All right, Zach. So we talked through kind of everything that you'd be looking at in a consultant role coming into a property owner. But if there's three things that you can recommend to a new property owner or somebody that's just starting to manage their property, what are those those three tips? So number one thing I would suggest would be consider hiring somebody such as myself, a habitat consultant, whetstone habitat. I do this for a living. My goal is to help make the transition of a, of a recent landowner or maybe somebody that's had a property for a long time and just hasn't been seeing the results that they want. My goal is to get them going in the right direction and kind of take some off of that learning curve. It can be pretty difficult and frustrating and time and, and money consuming to figure out how to do all this stuff on your own, whether, whether you read all the magazines and, and articles online or watch a hundred YouTube videos on how to do something until you've done it yourself. Sometimes it's just difficult to pick up these tricks and to be able to su succeed. So my goal is to help these landowners. I'll give them a, a very thorough management plan with being a biologist and wanting those results for you, whether it be deer, turkey, quail, songbirds, what have you, just diversity, pollinators, with my background, I understand how to get from where you're at to where you're going. So I'll hand over a management plan that's thorough. It'll tell you how, when, why, where you're doing these habitat improve improvements. And I'll talk you through every, every step of the way. Like I want it to be dummy proof when I hand it over so that there's no confusion in carrying out that plan. I want it to be as streamlined as possible to save you time, money, and frustration down the road. So consider talking to somebody that does this for a living that, that can comprehend the amount of time you're willing to put into a property. Um, it can get you, get you going in the direction you want. Number two, I would say um, figure out what your biggest hole in the habitat schedule is. Typically, most areas that I consult in in the Midwest um, it's going to be that late hunting season going like winter heading into early spring um, late season the deer are already depleted they're getting bumped around by hunters all year um, and the food sources just aren't there you look around now and everything's green like it looks like a deer can eat themselves sick like anywhere they go but you get on to the dormant season when all the leaves are off the trees and the deer are starting to browse to make a living and all the the crops have been harvested um, it's a, it's a struggle when, especially when those does get pregnant and they're, and they're raising those fawns inside of them. They need to start getting ready to produce milk and the bucks lose their antlers and they've just been rutting hard all November. Like that time of year, late winter, December to March is really hard on your herd. So chances are most areas that's going to be the most stressful period. How can you make the biggest impact for your wildlife during that time of the year? So a lot of times supplemental food sources. It's doing some temporary forest openings like this, try to increase the stem count, meaning 
uh, of your woodlot, meaning that there's going to be much more browse and opportunity for those deer to eat those, those buds of the trees during the dormant season. Um, so you want to diversify their food options going into that late winter, early spring window. Um, so it might be food plots. Like I said, it might be just simple habitat improvement plans or just getting sunlight to the ground. Um, and the third most important thing I want to talk about, especially when we're talking about hunting and hunting success, is going to be your access routes, especially for guys hunting small acreages. It's super important you find ways to get in and out of those stands without disrupting deer because it doesn't take much to blow your entire property out. If you keep bumping deer every time you're going in there, they're going to be educated very quickly. So figuring out a management plan, which is something I, I, I think about all the time is, okay, if we're going to do this and the deer are going to steer that direction, we need to put a stand here to cut them off before they're going to that food source. It, it's all a puzzle. It's a chess match. You're playing with the deer and having somebody with the experience to look at that and put it all into, into one clean package to get you going in the right direction is super important. So accessing those stands is, is going to increase your, your hunting success probably threefold. Um, just because you're not educating the deer down the road. So Zach, that's all great tips. Next, we're gonna go over to the new food plot that you're putting in and kind of show that work being done, getting ready for that, that late season food for the deer. Awesome, let's do it. All right, Zach, so we already talked about clearing things out, getting trees out of the way to let light in, letting some of the natural foliage come back in. But now let's dive into a little bit more of what you can do, what you can add to your property via food plots or those other things that would help the, the deer and other wildlife? So I'm always talking about trying to fill in the, the void. What, what's your biggest gap on your nutritional calendar for deer when we're, when we're managing for deer? Oftentimes it's gonna be during hunting season, going into the winter, into the spring, the uh, deer are getting ready to drop fawns, start growing new set of antlers. They're really nutritionally depleted and all the native vegetation for the most part is dormant. So that's where I'm looking at the gap. Like here, we got a nice cool uh, fall food plot that we just got in the ground, getting ready to plant. So that's gonna be coming up with some fresh nutrition when all the native stuff starts turning yellow, starts dropping its leaves and starts losing its nutritional value. So I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking about where is the nutrition needed most, both location-wise and time-wise and kind of planting my fields in, in accordance with what the most demand is. So walk us through a little bit of the phases of how you get to seeds in the ground. So obviously there's work that happens beforehand. Talk us through that up to getting the seeds in. So biggest thing is gonna be a soil test. Um, I, I recommend it to all of my clients getting out there, get a soil test done, figure out what your pH is, figure out what, uh, what you need as far as uh, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium. Um, so you can go in and, and put the appropriate amount of fertilizer down. Nobody likes wasting money and just going up there throwing a bunch of triple 19 on the ground might be a waste of money when there might be some shortcuts you can take. Um, you can throw all the fertilizer in the world out there. If you don't get your pH right, it's not gonna be able to be taken up by the plants. So it's a balancing act. Um, you definitely wanna get your pH right um, and then fertilize accordingly. So once you get your soil test back, figure out what you, what you need to do to amend the soils, you can go in and, and then you have to site prep. So kill off whatever's there. I like using Roundup, uh, glyphosate, it's, it's, it's cheap, it's easy to buy, it kills pretty much anything it touches except for Roundup ready corn, soybean, canola varieties that, that are designed to survive that Roundup. So you wanna clear the site with herbicide, you can mow it, disc it, you wanna prep the ground, get the ground ready to, to broadcast your seeds or to drill your seeds in. Um, and then you're gonna go in broadcast the seed and come back. My equipment, I use uh, Ferminator. Um, it's got a hopper in it. It's got a disc in the front of it. It's a great little machine. Um, so it can actually break up the soil, drop the seeds in the ground, and it's got these big heavy cult packers in the back to kind of finish off that planting process all in one pass. So it's been a great piece of equipment that I've used over the years. So what about the folks that don't have access to a tractor? How would you recommend they approach? So I would do, it up? yeah, I would do the same thing as far as herbicides go, um, kill it off with glyphosate, whatever it might be. It might be an old hay pasture or a power line that you're trying to plant on the corner of your property. I know I've done that plenty of times. Try to kill it off. You can get in there and, and use a weed eater and cut that vegetation down. Or if you can get a mower back there, get a mower down there, try to rake up some of that thatch or even even burn it off if, if you can and you feel comfortable doing that with uh, prescribed fire. Um, you just want to expose the dirt 
And then you can get out there. If you don't have access to heavy equipment, um, smaller seeds do better. It's easier to get smaller seeds in the ground than it is bigger seeds because you don't have to till it as, per se. So I would think clovers, brassicas, stuff that's going to be real tiny diameter seeds. You can get out there, broadcast it, and you can even take just like a heavy rock rake and start working that soil to get those in there or time it around a rainstorm. If you got a nice soaking rain, something where you're going to get an inch of rain over the course of a day, get out there right before that rainstorm comes in, broadcast your, your small little seeds in there. And those raindrops will actually work those seeds into the soil and give you better germination down the road. So you don't need heavy equipment to get your food plots in the ground. Um, you just need to be cognizant of how much time you have and how much effort you're willing to put into it to make the food plots great. But don't skimp on the lime and fertilizer, even if you don't have heavy equipment. Because like I said, if, if you don't get the soil amended, you're not going to have the results you want. Yeah, if the foundation's not there, it's not gonna take as well. Exactly. So what are you, when you're hand spreading seed, obviously you can reach in the bag and throw it. Yep. But you were using kind of a crank. Yeah, so it's just a sling, it's got a pouch on it. I think Earthbro is the company that I was using. Um, you can adjust how open that uh, port is that drops the seeds down. As, as you turn it, it'll broadcast it. Um, really popular for people seeding like a yard or anything like mm -hmm. that. I think I got that at Home Depot. You can get it at any any hardware store, and I can't tell you how many hundreds of acres I've, I've planted with, with that exact device. Um, cheap to get, you can, the bigger seeds, if you are gonna try to plant soybeans, corn, what have you, and broadcast it, you can go ahead and reach into the bag and throw it. You can do that with these smaller seeds too, but I like, I like that sling device. It's just, it's more consistent broadcasting. Um, like I said, you can adjust how big the opening is. So um, it can be real heavy in some portions that are going to get a lot of sunlight. Whereas like up near the tree line here, I was a little lighter on my broadcast because those plants aren't going to do as well anyways, just because they're getting shaded for half the day from the trees behind them. So it's adjustable as you go, but th there's options. You don't need one of those slings, but they definitely help and they'll save you some time and effort. So what are you going to do after the seeds are out and down? Is there any kind of maintenance stuff that you do on it or you just let nature run at that point so it depends on what you're planting like around here um we just did a fall blend it had like oats triticale seven card stud um it's got rape turnips um i treated this plot i sprayed it i mowed it down this was actually a section of my soybean field before so i had to get rid of my soybeans to make room for my fall plots um, but I got plenty of beans around, so it's it's not an issue. It's more important to have that late season nutrition in the form of greens than it is. I have plenty of bean pods that'll be around. Maintenance after you plant it. So once you get it in the ground, um, you can, if it's, a, with the blends, it's harder. You can't really do anything with the blends where you have grasses and, and forbs coming up in the same mixture. Because typically what you'll do is say, I plant a clover field and I get some grasses popping up in it, there's grass selective herbicides that'll just kill the grass. So it might be a good idea to go through and spray that. Um, or if you plant just oats or wheat or rye, there's gonna be broadleaf selective herbicides that you can use, um, such as like 2,4-D that you can go in there and you can kill all the broadleafs and leave those grasses um, to help them along. But with these blends where you have grasses and leafy vegetation, you're, you kind of got your hands tied. So it's really important to take care of all your weeds before you even plant it. So now all we're doing, we're, we're praying for rain for the most part. Um, other than that, there's not much we can do that would successfully help control a plot with so many blends in it. But the blends are good. We want diversity. We want there to be desirable forage out there for them for a longer period of time. That's why I went with this uh, seven species blend for this particular plot. And so getting into the season, are you gonna hunt over this field and how would you kind of approach hunting this field? So this field I am gonna hunt over. Um, we got archery season coming up right around the corner here in Kentucky. And uh, I want something, especially those, those oats in this blend, when they start springing out of the ground and some of that clover, the deer just demolish it. Now it's gonna be competing with, the soybeans will still be green, um, but this is going to be something different, something new, something fresh that, that's popping up. I'm, I'm going to hunt this. It's kind of a natural pinch point on my property, um, which has great access from, from the main driveway coming in. I can sneak in through the corn that I planted over there as a visual barrier. So I'm using it again to my advantage um, to get into this blind. Um, it's going to be a good afternoon sit. It's going to be something I wouldn't sit in the morning early season because those deer are probably going to be out in the soybeans at dark 
it's going to be hard to get in here. I typically don't hunt mornings early season. Um, so this would be a great afternoon sit for me, um, assuming I get the rain in it and it comes up the way it should. Well, thanks, man. This is all really informative personally, and I'm sure the all of our viewers are going to love this stuff too. I appreciate it, man. It's been fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a ton, Zach. As you can tell, Zach knows a lot about how to build your habitat on your property to make it most conducive to wildlife. He's got tips for improving hunting and just bird watching if that's what you're into. If you want to find out more about Zach and Whetstone Habitat and how he can put a plan together for your property, make sure you check out his website and his social media profiles down in the show notes. And don't forget he's on Go Wild, so join us on there and come have a conversation with him there too. So when we got together with Zach, we shot a ton of content. It's very timely for right now, right before deer season. We're going to be dropping another show here soon so make sure you subscribe and get those notifications turned on so you'll know when it's out there down in the comments section let us know is there something we didn't answer for you that maybe zach could help with or if there's some shows that you want to see done let us know that too thanks for watching us we'll see you all soon yeah.